In this video, we're going to look at how to check the assumption that the errors are uncorrelated in the context of fitting a linear regression model. So one of the challenges of checking whether the errors are correlated or uncorrelated is that there's so many possible patterns of correlation that can occur between them. So in practice, people really only worry about correlated errors in two contexts. So one is that the data are observed over time. So we have a temporal structure in the data. The other is that the data are observed in geographic space and we have geographically referenced the data. So we might have, for example, data in different counties or at different locations where we have temperatures or measurements or something like that. In those situations that we can, in fact, check for correlation among our errors, otherwise we're probably not going to worry about it. So if we make the assumption that the errors are correlated, then our residuals should at least be approximately uncorrelated, which suggests some plots that are some tools that we can use to check whether this assumption is reasonable. So the first tool that we'll talk about for checking whether the errors are correlated is a plot of the residuals versus time, assuming that there's a time, a time variable. And if there is no correlation among the errors, we would expect the plot of residuals over time to be a random scatter of points. If you do see a clear systematic pattern where you see, for example, strings of lots of negative residuals and then strings of positive residuals, that might be an indication of positive autocorrelation among your errors. If your residuals deviate back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative, that's actually an indication of negative temporal autocorrelation Though I'll be honest, in practice you cannot see this visually. Uh, for humans, for human eyes, that simply looks like a random scatter of points. You pretty much have no hope of detecting it visually. But if you do see strings of positive values and the negative values, that should be pretty obvious in this plot of residuals versus time. Another plot that you can use is to compare successive residuals. So you plot epsilon hat i plus one versus the previous residual, and you do that for the first n minus 1 observations. And if there's no correlation among the errors, we would expect this plot to be a random scatter of points. If instead you have positively correlated errors, you expect the plot of these residuals to have a positive slope. But if the residuals, I'm sorry, if the errors were negatively correlated, you would expect the plot of the residuals to have a negative slope when you compare successive residuals. So let's actually look at an example here so that we can see how to use these plots in practice. So we're going to look at a data set related to global warming, which is a hot topic in recent years. And reliable records for annual temperatures are really only available back through the 1850s. And in order to get information about temperatures prior to 1850, they use something called proxy variables. So proxy variables are a variable that you use to indirectly measure something else that's of more interest. And so in this data set, what we have is we have measurements of annual temperature from 1856 and later. We're gonna build a predictive model using the observed data. And then in theory, we would use the fitted model to predict temperatures back before 1856. And the data that we're going to use are available in the glob warm data set in the R fairway package. And the data in that data set are derived from work by Jones and Mann in 2004. So we're gonna, in this data set, we're gonna regress our temperature variable on the eight different proxy variables. You can actually see that regression down here. There are some missing values that we'll need to account for. Uh, most of the time, R will deal with those automatically. It removes the observations that have any missing values from our fitted model. And the first thing that we do is we simply plot the residuals versus time. So I load that glob worm data from the fairway package. I fit my model and I store it in LMOD. And then I plot my residuals versus time, making sure to omit any observations that are missing data. And then I specify a nice name for my y-axis and I add a horizontal reference line at y equal to zero. And here's the pattern that I observe for that global warming data. And I'm not, you have never, may, may never have used a plot like this before. And so what we're looking for is 
patterns or streaks of residuals that have the same sign uh, generally. So in this situation, what we see here is we sort of see this cyclical pattern where we have a bunch of positive residuals grouped together, we have a bunch of negative residuals grouped together, more positive residuals, more negative residuals, and so on. So this plot shows that over time, the residuals are more similar to what you would ex than what than to what you would expect if, in fact, there were no correlation among the errors. So this plot, plot right here suggests that the errors do have positive correlation. The other plot that we talked about was plotting the lagged residuals. So we plot epsilon i versus epsilon epsilon hat i versus epsilon hat i plus one. And unfortunately, I don't know of any function that automatically produces this plot in R. Um, so we have to use a little bit more detailed coding in order to produce it. So the first thing I do here is I use the nobs function to extract the number of observations in my linear model. The tail function right here is going to grab the last n minus one observations, last n minus one residuals for my fitted model. The head function is going to grab the first n minus one observations uh, of my residuals from the residuals of my fitted model. And you think about comparing those to one another, that is in fact going to give me a plot of epsilon hat i plus one versus epsilon hat i. So it's gonna give us exactly what we want if we do it like this. I do some fancy labeling of the x and y axes, and then I add a reference line uh, at a vertical line at x equal to zero and a horizontal line at y equal to zero. And executing that command produces the following plot right here. So this plot of successive residuals. And as I mentioned before, if there's if the errors are uncorrelated, we would expect this plot of the successive residuals to be a random scatter of points, which, which is certainly not the case here. So when we look at this, we see this clear upward trend. And so this, also, this plot also gives us evidence that the errors are in fact co positively correlated for this particular data set. For those of you who are not interested in these informal plots which require more interpretation. If you want to test a common test that's frequently used to test for positive autocorrelation among time series data is the Durbin-Watson test. And the Durbin-Watson test essentially chooses between the null hypothesis that there is no correlation among the data or the residuals in this case versus some alternative where it could be testing for positive autocorrelation negative autocorrelation or that there's no that there's just some autocorrelation doesn't regard regardless of the direction among our residuals the only thing i wanted to point out about the durbin watson test statistic is that similar to our last plot the test statistic is based on successive residuals and so it's trying to look at how these successive res residuals deviate from one another So under the null hypothesis that the errors are uncorrelated, um, then the test statistic should be a linear combination of chi-square distributions. And in fact, this test is implement implemented in the LM test package. So after installing that package, we can load it using the library function. And then to perform the Dearborn Watson test, we use the DW test function here, where we specify the regression model that we want to fit. I tell it the data set where the data frame where the data are located, and then it produces the relevant output here. And the scale of the Durbin Watson statistic probably doesn't mean anything to you, but the p-value here is pretty close to zero. And so our observed data are very incompatible with the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis was that the errors were uncorrelated, or actually technically the residuals were uncorrelated. And because we reject that null hypothesis, because the data are very incompatible with the null hypothesis, we believe that the errors are in fact probably correlated. And this specific test was for positive autocorrelation. So our conclusion here would be that we think the errors are in fact positively correlated and not uncorrelated. So if the assumption that the errors are uncorrelated is violated, what can we do in terms of uh, improving or correcting uh, our regression model. Well, 
probably the best approach is to use something called generalized least squares instead of ordinary least squares. And generalized least squares estimation takes the correlation of the errors into account when you are fitting your model. You have to specify a model for the correlation, but it actually does produce the best linear unbiased estimates if you are able to do that. If there's no apparent temporal or spatial link between your observations, in other words, there's no, the data are not observed over time or they're not geographically referenced data, it's almost impossible to check for correlation between the errors. But the good news is that if you can't check for the correlation among the errors, there's really no reason to suspect it either. And so you can pretty much safely ignore this assumption and not worry about checking it.